for the September edition of the Freshwater Stewardship Community. We're very excited to have Darissa here from the Invasive Species Center to talk all about kind of this uh, prevailing threat to all of Canada's ecosystems, both on the land and in the water. And she's going to be giving us some really great information about the Invasive Species Center and the work that they're doing and how you can get involved to help protect your property or nearby areas from invasive species. So we're going to start off with some introductions. Then Doris is going to go into her presentation. We will leave plenty of time at the end for Q&A. I know some people submitted their questions ahead of time, so we'll be sure to get to those. And then we're also going to go over some different education resources that are available to you with respect to invasive species. So the two people that are with you today, the first is Darissa. So she's the community action leader at the Invasive Species Center. And her email is up on the screen there. If you have any questions that you think of after today's session, you are welcome to send her an email. And if you have any sort of questions about technology, resources that are mentioned, anything like that, feel free, feel free to send me a private message or a follow-up email as well. So a bit about this community. I recognize some of your names and know that you've attended previous sessions with us, but the Freshwater Stewardship Community was launched at the beginning of this year. We actually just hit a thousand members this month, which is very exciting across the country and really across the globe. It is an online community where we are trying to stay connected with each other and informed on different issues that are happening around our lakes and rivers and how we can take community level action to address these different problems and also to lead really great education and outreach opportunities for our waterfront communities. We have hosted as of uh, an hour from now, we'll have hosted 11 webinars and created 10 accompanying education resources. And if you've missed any of those or you would like to reaccess them, you can do so at watersheds.ca slash freshwater hyphen stewardship. And we would like to thank the SM Blair Family Foundation for funding this community. Really quickly, if you don't know who Watersheds Canada is, we are a national nonprofit and charitable organization. We are based in Perth, Ontario, which is about an hour from Ottawa, really focused on working with community groups, students, youth, and shoreline property owners to help protect their waterfront. So that is their river, lakes, and shorelines. We do this through three main programs. The first you can see on the screen is our Natural Edge Shoreline Renaturalization Program. We also, in partnership with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, deliver the Love Your Lake Stewardship and Education Program. We have a number of free resources that we've created on our website, specifically around shoreline health and especially establishing and improving wildlife habitat. And then we also do a lot of work with fish habitat, so specifically with spawning beds, in water habitat, and also cold water creek restoration. So I encourage you to check out any of the links that were on the screen if you would like to learn more about that work. So without further ado, we're going to have Darissa uh, give her presentation. So just a bit about her. As I mentioned, she is the Community Action Leader at the Invasive Species Center, which is located in Sault Ste. Marie. She completed her undergraduate degree in biology, along with obtaining a certificate in geomatics from Algoma University. And in her current role, Darissa controls, sorry, co coordinates invasive species education and outreach initiatives and promotes community actions to mitigate the spread of invasive species in Ontario. So this includes the facilitation of the Early Detection and Rapid Response Network. And she also helps with community science to help protect, detect, prevent, detect, and monitor new invasions. Darissa believes that everyone in the community has a role to play in protecting Canada's forests and waterways and is passionate about sharing the tools and knowledge to do so. So I'm going to stop my screen and Darissa if you would like to share your presentation we can get going. Absolutely. Hopefully you can see the presentation now. I can. Awesome. Well thank you Monica for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, my name is Teresa Vincentini, as 
Monica said, and I'm the community action leader at the Invasive Species Center. Um, I'm going to turn off my webcam for the presentation, but I'll put it back on for the questions and answer period, um, just to make sure that you get all the information we don't have lagging bandwidth here. All right, and since you can't see me, if you hear me take an awkward pause, I'm just grabbing a quick drink. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to be giving you an introduction to invasive species and their impacts, as well as outline how to prevent invasive species spread and how to take action. Make sure I can change the slides, perfect. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today from the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, uh, home of Garden River First Nations and Batchewana First Nations, as well as the Métis Nation. I would like to extend my gratitude for their continuous care of the land and water. Uh, the Invasive Species Center, if you're not familiar with us, is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to help prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, eco economy, and society. So first we're going to begin with a little introduction to what is an invasive species. So an invasive species is an organism that is introduced outside of its native range and causes harm within its new, newly introduced range. A non-native species is not inherently considered invasive as it has to negatively impact the ecology, the economy, or society of its new, new range to be considered invasive. And typically invasive species affect all three of these. Some characteristics of invasive species after being introduced uh, include that they're fast growing and reproduce very quickly, being very prolific. They lack natural predators that would normally slow their spread and keep their population in check. And the target species and native species lack natural defenses against the invasive species from not having evolved alongside each other. All of these characteristics contribute to the exponential population growth of invasive species and the severity of their impacts. Increased trade and travel have been the catalyst for a spread of invasive species across the world. Sometimes this is intentionally importing the species like introducing a plant due to its aesthetics or medicinal properties in other areas of the world or unintentional like the case with a lot of aquatic invasives that hitch rides on big shipping freights, for example, in the ballast waters. Because of this, the number of introductions of invasive species continues to increase um, both intercontinentally as well as within uh, uh, continents, national boundaries or provincial boundaries. One way that we tackle invasive species is through the power of community science. Community science is important for increasing education and outreach to further the collective understanding of invasive species and their pathways of spread. It provides collaboration between the public and scientific community, and it's an extremely cost-effective way to collect important data and gain access to new areas. It increases the eyes on the ground, contributing to important research and monitoring. The more eyes on the ground means that we have more, we're more likely to spot the first detection of a new introduction or an invasive species that is expanding its range. So this brings me to the Early Detection and Rapid Response Network, Ontario. It's our community science program here at the Invasive Species Center. It's coordinated with the, uh, by the Invasive Species Center and delivered in partnership with the Ontario Invasive Plant Council and the Eastern Ontario Model Forest, which is uh, partnered with Ontario Woodlot Association. And it is funded by the Ontario Trillium Fund. Our current area of focus is actually in the Kingston, Rideau and Quinty catchment of Eastern Ontario. So what is EDRR? The EDRR network is a community science and community action network aimed to train citizens on how to detect, report, and respond to invasive species in Ontario. It's an eyes on the ground approach to stopping new introductions or preventing further spread of invasive species. We achieve this by providing tools, training, and resources through education and outreach so everyone can help play a part. The EDRR network helps fill invasive species knowledge and tool gaps and inform communities of incoming threats. Um, we help coordinate stewardship, removal, 
removals with local organizations and volunteers. We link partners with invasive species resources, um, other volunteers or other needs, uh, provide opportunities to work with a wide range of organizations on various area projects, and we respond to public inquiries. This graph depicts the invasion curve. The EDRR network focuses its efforts at or before species arrival. Uh, that could be a local arrival within your community or all the way up to a high level threat for a new introduction into Canada. Prevention and early detection are key to mitigating the cost and time required to manage a species. Uh, and it also increases the feasibility of a species being successfully managed uh, the earlier that it is detected. The earlier we can detect a potential invasive species, the quicker we can act and react to eradicate the species before it has a large impact on human health, biodiversity, the economy, or society. Once the species is established, the strategy often shifts from eradication to managing and containment, since eradication becomes less feasible. So things that you can expect from the EDR network um, are webinars such as this, community science opportunities, early detection alerts and outreach, outreach and educational material, best management practices and expertise, presentations, and also um, resource sharing between partners. So now we're gonna get into the impacts of uh, invasive species. As I mentioned, there are three, three or four areas of impacts that invasive species can cause, and those include economic, ecological, social, and then human health impacts. So invasive species can ca cause large economic impacts. The total estimated expenditures by municipalities and conservation authorities across Ontario per year is estimated around 50.8 million. On top of the cost of management by municipalities and conservation authorities, the potential economic impacts on agriculture, fisheries, forests, healthcare, tourism, and the recreational uh, recreation industry are estimated to be approximately 3.6 billion per year in Ontario. Uh, this bar graph on the screen just gives you a bit of a look on what, uh, what was spent on each species during the years of 2017 and 2019, showing emerald ash borer as the number one cost. Learning from the emerald ash borer out outbreak and the devastating effects, we can use this to determine the economic cost um, if another forest pest or disease were to be introduced. For example, oak wilt is caused by a disease that kills oak trees, and oak wilt has been found less than one kilometer from the Windsor, Ontario border, and is a top invasive threat to Ontario. If it were to arrive in Ontario, preliminary estimates predict costs of 66.5 million to cut and replace street trees in just the GTA. On a more individual level, many invasive species cause property values to decrease as well as are, since it's due to the negative impacts and they are difficult to get rid of once they're established on a property or in a water, waterway. Some examples of invasive species that cause such economic costs include Japanese knotweed. Um, the strong roots and shoots of this plant can damage concrete, concrete and asphalt, posing threats to buildings, sidewalks, and roads. Manual cost of this plant is costly. Manual control of this plant is costly and labor intensive. Um, so it makes it very difficult to manage. Zebra and quagga mussels uh, cause significant impacts to municipal water intakes. In 2019, Ontario municipal expenditures on zebra and mus uh, quagga mussels were estimated at 8.9 million per year alone. Um, emerald ash borer, like we already talked about, the cost of damage to Canadian private and municipal ash trees is an estimated 451 million over 30 years. So just to give you a, a few examples of economic costs per species. Okay, there we go. Um, as you can, um, can imagine, based on the characteristics of invasive species, um, with their fast spreading, reproducing quickly, lacking natural predators, and native species lacking defense mechanisms, 
they can cause significant ecological impacts. Um, uh, some of those ecological impacts include the changing species composition and diversity in a landscape, altering how the ecosystem functions. They kill plants and trees that provide valuable socio socioeconomic and ecological benefits. They can infect, wound, parasitize, or kill uh, species at risk. They eliminate or greatly reduce populations that are only found in one geographic location. Uh, they reduce biodiversity by outcompeting desirable native species and reduce critical habitats that species at risk need to survive. And they do all of this in such a short time that evolution doesn't have time to react. As of 2020, there are 622 wildlife species at risk in Canada. Many of these species are impacted by invasive species. And here are just some of those examples. American ginseng is, an important, is important for biodiversity and has a lo long been used in traditional medicine by indigenous peoples. American ginseng is threatened by garlic mustard, an aggressive invasive plant that outcompetes for resources, changes soil chemistry, produces up to six 60,000 seeds annually, and has populations that can double in size every four years. Uh, monarch butterflies lay their eggs on dog strangling vine, which is another invasive plant. And then they are unable to complete their life cycle since their caterpillars actually can only feed on milkweed. Lake sturgeon, like many other native fish species in the Great Lakes, are host to the parasitic sea lamprey which suctions to the body of the fish, scraping the tissue and consuming the blood of the fish. The fish either die from blood loss or infection. Phragmites is also affecting all species at risk reptiles in Ontario because it often establishes in their overwintering grounds where it can completely change the ecosystem. It grows so thick that turtles have to have a difficult time moving through the stand and it also shades out the area. Reptiles are ectothermic and rely on regulating their body temperature by basking in the sun. Invasive species are not the only reason that these species are at risk and likely isn't the reason that they became at risk in the first place. Um, however, it adds to the number of factors that is threatening these already vulnerable populations, making, them, making it even more difficult for them to bounce back and recover. Impacts to public safety. Um, if you were in Eastern Ontario at all this spring, you may have noticed the outbreak of the LDD moth, which is formerly known as the gypsy moth. Um, the outbreak in the past few years has uh, increased the number of reports of um, histamine reactions and rashes. Um, the little hairs on the caterpillars can, ca can cause these and if the caterpillar is in great abundance, like we did see these past few years, the hairs can actually even be found um, floating in the air. And then just, so you don't even have to have a caterpillar on you, just the hair itself. Um, invasive Phragmites is another example. It's a, an invasive perennial grass commonly found along roadside ditches that forms dense monocultures and can reach up to five meters in height. The height of the stalks can impact visibility at intersections and around corners, putting drivers at risk. Um, some aquatic examples include water chestnut. Um, it has the, these really hard seeds that's seen in the top left of the picture of the European water chestnut on the bottom left. Um, and they float to the, or they don't float, they sink to the bottom of water bodies. Um, and go, get washed up on shores, making it likely to encounter the sh sharp seeds if you're walking on uh, into the water and they can puncture your foot. Um, water soldier on the bottom right is also hazardous to humans as it has sharp serrated edges that are sharp and rigid enough to actually penetrate the skin while people are swimming or while walking in the water. And of course, I think most people have heard of giant hogweed the sap of this plant can cause serious photosensitivity, which if you have it on in con if you come in contact with it on your skin, will cause sunburns and boils when exposed to UV light. 
and this can actually last for years after exposure. Some social impacts um, in the aquatic systems. Many aquatic invasive species decrease the enjoyability of recreational activities on the water, such as swimming, boating, and recreational fishing. Aquatic invasive plants create large dense mat masses, um, which often inhibit boating and make it difficult or impossible to swim. They can have an effect on fish populations and fish health, and can even be dense enough to inhibit boating getting caught in the motors. Um, zebra mussels also make it less desirable to walk in the water since they can be very sharp as well. Some social terrestrial impacts um, of invasive species. Uh, they also make it less enjoyable to be outdoors and in natural spaces. Neighborhoods that are beautiful, full of large trees um, are dying, such as the ash trees, um, and, and or being cut down to prevent the spread of emerald ash borer. Um, as you can see in the bottom right photo, uh, it looks like it was a beautiful neighborhood. And even down the street a bit, there's some trees that seem untouched, and it's, but then the trees up in the foreground um, are starting to die off. And it's, it's not as pleasing. And it also has an impact on mental health when we talk about neighborhoods. Um, if you were in Eastern Ontario, like I said, the, LD, the abundance of LDD moth caterpillars, um, you, wouldn't, you weren't able to sit outside without having them crawling on you or even having uh, their excretion fall on you as well while they were uh, eating the leaves. Um, many campers at provincial parks decided to cut their vacations short because of it. And on top of that, walking through forests in some places resembled fall because of the heavy defoliation on the trees. And like I said, these are just some, like a handful of examples of uh, invasive species, and there's a lot that we didn't even touch. So after all that bad news, what's the good news? The good news is there's something that you can do to help prevent introductions of new invasive species and prevent the spread of invasive species. Firstly, you can learn how to identify some invasive species and how to prevent accidentally contributing to their range expansion through known pathways such as hiking, firewood, watercrafts, etc. Um, avoid infested areas if you do know of an infested area. And if you can't, then reduce your speed when traveling by any invasive plants, especially aquatic plants. Um, boat wakes and motors can dislodge the plants and offsets or break off fragments, allowing them to spread to new areas. Inspect your equipment and yourself, both in aquatic and terrestrial equipment, such as boats, trailers, fishing gear, um, after each use and after hiking and camping, inspect your clothes, shoes, and even dogs for invasive plant seeds. Avoid planting or purchasing invasive aquatic or terrestrial plants in your vegetable and fruit gardens water gardens or aquariums, gardeners should only use native or non-native, or sorry, non-invasive plants that are encouraged and are encouraged to ask garden centers and aquarium suppliers for plants that are not invasive. Follow all your clean drain dry protocols when moving between water bodies. Remove all plants, animals, and mud, drain all live wells and standing water, and dry your boat and equipment before moving to the new water body. Don't dump your bait or, where possible, use locally sourced and caught bait. The provincial government has protocols on how to properly dispose of bait within Ontario. And this is one of the pathways of in Asian carp introductions as the juveniles look similar to some of our bait fish. So also learn how to identify your bait fish. Um, clean your boots, clothes, and outdoor gear of hitchhiking plant seeds. Um, as I mentioned, inspect all your equipment. Especially this time of year, uh, the end of August through the fall, when most plants have gone to seed. Buy and burn local firewood to avoid spreading insects and pathogens that are hiding in, under the bark and inside the wood. We can't see them and we don't know that they're there. And like I said, always choose native species. 
a very important thing that you can do is report any invasive species that you see. Um, you can report through EDMAPS at www.eddmaps.org or by downloading the EDMAPS app and creating an account. These reports go directly to experts who verify that an identification was made correctly. Um, so make sure to take a picture to include it with your report. And it's also nice because then you don't have to be sure of what you're reporting. If you think that you have something or it could potentially be something, report it anyways, and then an expert can look at it. We'd rather have too many reports um, that aren't positive reports than miss an early, uh, an early introduction species. Um, so when in doubt, report it anyways. Um, these reports are very important as they help, make, help us make those early detections with more eyes on the ground, making reports such as um, more eyes on the ground such as community members, not just limiting it to the number of folks that are were actually working in that field. Um, they also allow us to map out the distribution of invasive species across geographical boundaries. Um, this give us, gives us the best holistic understanding and the more reports we get, the more accurate it is. Reporting species that are widespread um, and that we see er everywhere is also very important. So like Japanese knotweed is pretty common, um, but even if it's common in your neighborhood, it's still important to report it. It'll help you get familiar with the reporting process so that if you do see a high priority species, you're already ready to go. Um, and it also, like I said, just helps us with getting a better holistic understanding of the distribution of invasive species. Um, it helps us select sites for management and outreach opportunities. It increases local knowledge of distribution. It uh, helps us understand the movement of invasive species over time. Um, it could also potentially help influence policies, uh, enact a response plan for high priority species. Um, so when in doubt, report. I'm gonna keep reiterating that. <laughs> Um, there are other ways to report, though, outside of EDMAPS if you prefer not to use uh, an online method and are more comfortable calling in, then there is the Invading Species Hotline, um, as well as the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And I will provide all of these uh, in the resource document that I send over to Monica afterwards. So you don't have to make sure you write them down. <laughs> Aside from what you can do in everyday lives to help reduce the risk of spreading invasive species, the Invasive Species Center, along with the plenty of its partners, um, often have community science initiatives where you can have an active participation in invasive species monitoring and management. So one example that we have going on right now is the Community Science Tree Check Form in partnership, in partnership with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency where you can report the health status of your neighborhood trees. We outline 10 signs and symptoms of invasive species infestations on trees on our website at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca forward slash tree check form, where you can also fill out the survey on your tree as many times as you want. So you can do 10 trees in your neighborhood, one tree in your neighborhood, a whole stand of trees, as many times as you want. Um, the best part is, is that you don't need to be an expert. It's very easy to follow, and you don't need to know anything about the trees or about invasive species. I can briefly go over the signs and symptoms right now, but they are on our website and they will be defined on the website as well. So we're looking for leaf discoloration, branch dieback, holes, cracks, peeling bark, woodpecker activity, egg masses on the trees, um, frost, which is that excretion from caterpillars, uh, mold growth on the leaves, sap excretion, uh, feeding activity, and as well as obviously the insect populations themselves. Um, these signs and symptoms don't necessarily mean that there's an invasive species present. However, if you look at a tree and it shows these unhealthy signs, then you can take that information and say, well, why? Why is it showing these unhealthy signs? So we encourage you to fill out the survey. It's basically a, do you see these signs and symptoms on your tree? You take a picture of your tree. Um, and you send it in, and then we get experts to kind of look them over, and then we can hopefully spot some high priority, well, hopefully we spot no high priority invasive species, but 
if they are present, this gives us a first glance at it. Another initiative that we have right now is the photo contest in partnership with the Federation of Ontario's Cottagers Association. Um, and this is through our iSample On uh, program. However, this photo contest actually ends tonight at 11.59. So if you'd like to submit and enter, then get it done today. Um, we're calling on, calling on Ontarians to submit a photo along with a description of why or how they are protecting their lake from invasive species introductions for a chance to win an awesome lakeside pri prize pack. This lakeside prize pack includes a hammock, a waterproof speaker, camping blanket, a chili mousse tumbler, and some ISC swag. Um, through this photo contest, we hope to provoke thought and raise awareness on the, uh, on the impacts of invasive species to our waterways and how to prevent introductions and spread. The results of the contest entries will help gain a, a better understanding of why outdoor enthusiasts and shoreline property owners want to protect what they value, as well as what they're willing to do to limit the pathways of spread. So enter to win by going to our website forward slash iSample on, where you can also learn more about the iSample on project. Um, like I said though, the deadline is tonight at 11.59, so make sure you get that in soon. If you have more questions about invasive species, you can always go to our website um, where you can sign up for quarterly newsletters or biweekly media scans um, and event scans. Uh, you can learn about stewardship opportunities as they come up, upcoming webinars that may be of interest to you, um, and research in invasive species and more. On our website, you'll also find species profiles if you had a question about a particular species. You will also find technical bulletins, um, very thorough best management practices for managing a specific invasive species on your property or in your community. It even goes through what types of permits you need or approvals you need, um, for instance, with aquatic plants. Um, there are also some easy to follow fact sheets such as invasive species and climate change or invasive species in the economy, which gives you a very high level and understanding of these issues. You can also always look at our YouTube channel to find past webinars um, that you may have missed or see some how-to videos for management like for example, at the bottom right, there's a how to manage garlic mustard by hand. So all these resources are available to you online. You can find them through our website and I'm gonna send some over to Monica as well. With that, I wanna say thank you again for having me today and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And I know it's a mouthful and there's tons of information, but hopefully, oh, here we go. Um, Hopefully you enjoyed it and we'll get to some questions as well. Thank you, Darissa. So we have some questions that were submitted ahead of time. So we'll start with those ones. The first one, uh, you kind of touched on this, but maybe we can go into it a bit of detail, how to, or if it's even possible to eradicate Eurasian milfoil. So Eurasian water milfoil is difficult to manage. Um, firstly, there is uh, a native water milfoil that we have in Ontario, and there's also a hybrid between native water milfoil and Eurasian water milfoil. And it's very difficult to, you can't identify which plant is which without actually counting the number of leaflets on the stem. Um, so firstly, you have to make sure that you actually have the invasive Eurasian water milfoil. Um, and then for actual management, I would uh, encourage you to go and look at the Eurasian water milfoil ma best management practice on our website um, because it goes through, like I said, it's very in depth and it goes through if you need any per permits, it goes through um, based on, it'll walk you through your situation too. So um, it gives you all the different options for a large infestation, a small satellite plant, um, and all these different scenarios so you can choose what's best for your area and your infestation and your shoreline property. So I encourage you to check that out. 
And like Jarissa has been saying, we are going to send you some of these main URLs so you know where to go on the Invasive Species Center website. But of course, if you want to check it out in the meantime, you're welcome to too, but we will be sending them out to everyone who has registered and attended. Our next question is about the Trent Severn Waterway. So the question is about invasive species of weeds and making you know like you've touched on Darissa making some of the places unsafe to boat through you can't also have any real aquatic wildlife uh, using the habitat so they're wondering what can be done for those species. Sure so in the Trent Severn waterway um, there's actually it's one of the only populations of water soldier in Ontario right now and actually, water soldier is only found in Ontario in all of North America. Um, so it is a waterway that's being monitored closely because of that. Um, and it does make it difficult to, you know, swim, use it recreationally. And you do want to take extra care when boating through there because you can contribute to spreading water soldier or any other in, uh, aquatic invasive species that are in there. Um, water soldier is very easily spread because it produces these offset plants, um, making it even extra prolific at spreading. But then your boat wake or your boat motor, like I said, can dislodge either those offset plants or even just a small fragment of the plant or leaf itself. And then that can be transported down the waterway on your boat if you move it to a different water. Um, and then that just allows it to spread even more. So the best thing that you can do on an everyday basis is just practicing clean, drain, dry if you're moving your boat between water bodies, um, making sure to slow down or um, avoid, completely avoid infested areas if you know, notice them, um, and just doing everything that you can to help prevent spreading it even further. Um, I know that Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, as well as the Ministry of Northern Development and Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry um, are working with that population right now of water soldier, but I don't know the current update of it or anything like that. Um, if you'd like to know more, you can always send me an email and we can work with you that way as well. A nice segue for dropping our emails in the chat. Um, so if you have questions for either of us, our emails are now there. Um, we have someone who's wondering about, you know, reporting, they feel like they report, but it's not actually solving the issue. So who would they go to to try and take responsibility for removing plants before they spread? So I'm guessing this isn't just on their own property, like around their property, but maybe on, on their lake. Who could they go to to try and take action before it becomes, you know, a full-blown takeover? Absolutely. And I, I guess I would start by just saying that your reports do matter, even if you don't feel like they, they aren't getting the, uh, the attention that they need. Um, resources within the government and organizations that do work with this are sometimes limited, and it's unfortunate because we know that these are widespread and we'd love to do as much as we possibly can um, and more to help prevent the spread of these invasive species. Um, but reports do help because they will contribute to the actual distribution maps, which is helpful even if it is a species that isn't high priority. So, for example, a high of a high priority aquatic plant, water soldier is one, and that's because it's not widespread across Ontario. Um, it's only found in the Trent Severn Waterway and then a couple private ponds and then uh, recently it has been found in another location. So they are working at trying to main, uh, contain the spread um, and then also eradicate these satellite populations that are popping up in other places. Um, and that is the best that we can do with that right now. Um, as I mentioned with the, um, the curve, the invasion curve, it's once we get past a certain point, it's almost unfeasible to actually eradicate a species and it does become, it, we move more to containment and preventing the spread. Um, that being said, if you're looking to do more in your community or uh, in a lake or something like that, um, you can always 
either reach out to us and we can discuss possible ways to collaborate, um, whether it is community science led and we can just even provide resources for you to put together your own community science project. Um, we can pass around those, along those best management practices for that specific species that you are dealing with. Um, and that will, like I said, outline any uh, permits that you might need or any other questions that you would need before actually doing any sort of management, especially on water bodies. Um, and yeah, so you, there's always just reaching out might be the best first step. And then we can go from there based on the specific situation. Um, unfortunately, invasive species are why like they're everywhere and we have limited resources but we do try to do our best. Great. Um, another one that was submitted beforehand, wondering if there's any way for people to go to their municipality with, say, the information from the reportings and try and lead some action on a, like a, uh, oh dear, like a bigger level <laughs> where maybe not just their water, but around the whole municipality. Absolutely. Um, municipalities, again, they also have limited resources, unfortunately, uh, and every municipality is different. Some of them do have invasive species, um, like people that deal specifically with invasive species within the municipality, and some of them don't. So each municipality is different. So I would encourage you to get become familiar with what type of roles your municipality already plays and then use that to uh, bring to them some information or bring something to them that they may not have even noticed or thought of. Um, that would def I would definitely recommend that. Um, we also, if you are part of a municipality, we have the community of practice, um, which is a, it's, it's kind of like a forum of municipality um, members, or not members, um, public workers and they can ask their invasive species questions. Uh, we post on there twice a month about uh, like a little blog post on a specific invasive species issue. And it's just a collaborative way for municipalities to talk about what they are doing, what their situations are, what um, boundaries they've, they've had to encounter and um, things like that. So we also have municipality um, help as well. Um, so you can uh, recommend that they join this community. Um, and, but also, you, again, you could always reach out to us or other local stewardship organizations um, and we can help with the process or resources that may help you bring attention to the uh, invasive species issue with your municip municipality. Great. So we have a question as well in the chat wondering about kind of reaching out to even see if there are invasive species already on your lake. So who you might recommend they reach out to either maybe to learn more about invasive species monitoring taking place or just what's happening locally. Absolutely. Uh, you can actually go to the EdMaps website or download the app yourself and you can look at the distribution maps for each species or for your lake. Um, so if someone has made a report on your lake, you can actually see that um, once it's been verified um, by an expert. So you won't get an incorrect report either. So once you make a report, it goes to the verifier and then it, if it's verified as correct, then it will be made public. Um, so that's one way that you can find some information about your lake. Um, another, if you're looking to, um, like, you can, looking to see what invasive species are on your lake, I've heard of lake associations putting together, like, a volunteer day to just go out and do an EDMAPS or invasive species, um, like, inventory on your lake, too. So you can look at doing that. We can provide resources on how to identify different invasive species or a little presentation specific for that area. Um, there's different ways that you can get that information and or just work with friends and family around the lake or a lake association, or if you are part of a lake association, um, then putting that together, too. Fantastic. And there are some case studies that have gone through Watersheds Canada, some different micro grant programs where people were piling it out 
very similar to what you're saying different species that they were seeing like buckthorn i know they did a removal and they were trying out some different manual techniques using different equipment um, so that information is also on our website you can see some of those case studies and then take that information you can either connect directly with the lake association or based on their results you can try and pilot that on your lakefront community as well someone's wondering if you have any recommendations for controlling richardson pond wheat I am not familiar with Richardson's pond weed personally. Um, I could find out or look into it. Um, I don't even think we have information on it on our website or anything like that either. Um, so unfortunately I don't have anything on top of my head, but I can certainly look into it further. But like I said, with any aquatic invasive plant, the biggest thing is just controlling the spread. So avoiding the area, trying not to dislodge the plants, um, uh, reducing your speed if you're going through an infestation, things like that. And I'm just going to drop another resource in the chat. We did host a webinar through this community in the summertime with Dr. Jo Lattimore from the University of Michigan. And she did a very in-depth identification webinar of different aquatic plants and the native versus invasive species, what to look for. So that might be a really great resource for some people who are just starting and they wanna know what specific things to look for in each of the plants. So I will drop that in the chat. Awesome. And um, yeah, just another question, like looking for other information. So, I, I mean, if Dorissa hasn't convinced you, I think we should all be visiting the Invasive Species Center website. They do have some really great in-depth materials and, you know, those um, best management practices, but then they also have easy to read fact sheets about species. So that's really great for more introduction level. If you're a member of a nature group or a waterfront association, then you can use those to start people off, start the discussion. And if you know you have an established population of invasive, then you can look more towards those best management practices. They have videos, uh, they post really great stuff on their social media feeds. So you can always go to them. And I think they have a pretty good spread of all of the different ways that you can learn to identify and then take action. Absolutely. And like I said, if you are just starting out and you'd like to put together a community science initiative, um, we also just help with, you know, the guidance process on how to do that and what you, what resources might be helpful for you or putting together specific ID uh, identification for plants that you may encounter in your area as well. And I know that the Federation of Ontario's Cottagers Association or FOCA also has a lot of community science initiatives around invasive species often. Um, so if your lake association is already a part of FOCA, then that might be a good avenue to, to look for support. And I'm just gonna put in the chat a quick evaluation survey. If people don't mind clicking through and just letting us know what you thought of the webinar today. And also there's a question we're looking at developing a more in-depth invasive species webinar kind of mini series within the freshwater stewardship community so if you can let us know as you already have you know some specific <laughs> species that you would like more information about that would be very helpful for us to know what to kind of spotlight in that mini series we have a question about if you know of any current or upcoming funding that would be available for municipalities to manage invasive species? Um, I don't know of any current funding. Um, however, if you are a part of a municipality um, as a public worker and you are looking for invasive species management, either support funding resources and stuff like that, I do encourage you to join the community of practice um, network and forum. You can find it on our website. Um, and if there is any funding available, at least through us, we would be sure to post it through the community of practice. Um, you can also join our mailing list um, and any funding that becomes available through us would be up on there. Um, in terms of outside funding, I'm not aware of any um, at this moment, but I'm not, I don't work in the municipalities as one of my coworkers roles, so I could also put you in touch with them.
trying to type and talk at awesome. the same time. So there's the <laughs> link for the municipal uh, community of practice in the chat, and we'll Thank also you. link out to that in our, our follow-up email. I think that is all of the questions. So I'm just going to take these last couple of minutes to share some other resources from watersheds kind of side of things that people might be interested in. So after this webinar, I would say in about a week's time or so, we will be creating one of these handouts for this specific workshop and it will go through all of the different resources that Darissa talked about. It's a really nice one page handout that you can give to your neighbors, family members, community group members, and they have all the information they need kind of as a summary. And then you can also link out to the webinar recording so that they can get more of the in-depth information we went over today. But here are just some of the examples that we've already created. So they usually accompany each webinar in the series and go into detail about different action steps that you can take, external resources, especially community science programs, or different resources that might you might use to get started with something. So uh, for one of them, for example, it was about dragonflies and, drag and damselflies. So there were different resources that were recommended by the speaker to get you started on recognizing those species and the different plants that they require. We also have an upcoming event. So this is actually through a collaborative network, the Lake Links Planning Committee that we are a part of. And it is an online workshop. So it's the 20th anniversary and it is taking place on Saturday, October 23rd. And there are going to be a number of different case studies featured at this workshop from different lake associations across Ontario, really talking about taking action. So we have all these values that we say are important to us when we go up to these waterfront areas, but are our actions actually lining up with that? So invasive species could really tie well into this. So I just encourage everyone to register for this free event by going to watersheds.ca slash lake hyphen links hyphen 2021. And I think that is the end of all of the questions that I see in the chat. Again, if anyone thinks of any after the fact, you are welcome to email either of us and we will be sending follow-up resources and the recording from today if you would like to watch back or again, send any of the resources to other people. And I'd like to thank Darissa again for giving us this wonderful presentation. Awesome, thank you so much, Monica, it was a pleasure.